note that Vanilla Singh uh, was invited to participate but has declined to be here this evening. So we will now begin the questions, uh, the first one in alphabetical order, and then we will vary the order in which uh, the questions will be answered. That will keep us all on our toes. And also we will be doing something called lightning rounds, quick answers to some of the questions. So, for the first question, uh, it will be a 60 second response. And they will go to Mr. Honda, then Mr. Connor, and then Mr. Van Landingham. Question number one, tell us what skills, experience, and or background best qualifies you to be a congressman for the 17th Congressional District. We'll Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've had over 30 years as a uh, public school teacher and administrator. I've had uh, uh, seats in the school board. I've been uh, board of supervisors, assemblyman and 14 years as a congressperson. I've had results, and the results I brought to this valley uh, was for everybody and not for only a few. Now I just wanted to make sure that the, the idea of um, having a voice in Congress is for everyone, and especially for the voiceless, and that uh, my presence in D.C. is for those who need to have presence there. And I believe that we have some of the folks here that we talked about having a voice for the voiceless, and a disciplined uh, presence in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Mr. Khan. Thank you. As I have uh, talked to folks around the district, I have seen an anxiety about whether the American dream is going to be available for the next generation. And my background as an economics teacher at Stanford, as someone who's written a book on manufacturing, as someone who's worked at the Commerce Department on economic issues, makes me uniquely suited to address the challenges of how are we going to prepare young people for the skills of the 21st century. It breaks my heart when I see people who are out of work and what are we going to do to prepare them for the jobs of the 21st century. I believe that there is a challenge of how we're going to make sure that people have equal opportunity in this country and I have spent my life thinking and working on economic issues that I believe can address the challenges of the 17th district. My hope is that we can provide every person in this district, young or old, who is out of work or who wants work, the skills so that they can find employment and compete in the 21st century. Thank you. Mr. I would have to say what qualifies me is that I am not a professional politician, the two gentlemen with me. I have not spent time in Washington. I'm not part of the party organization. I have been a technology executive here in this valley for close to 20 years. I've spent 20 years finding people jobs. That's what I do. I'm a talent acquisition. I've done it in quite a few different high-tech and very successful companies here, so I know what it is. It's not manufacturing. It's grooming our children to be leaders and entrepreneurs, grooming them to take advantage of what this valley holds. I mean, it's really time for a change, and that <clears throat> shift and that change and that call to our children are what are important. Thank you. Thank you. The next question will be uh, a 90 second response, and the order will be Mr. Khanna, Mr. Honda, then Mr. Van Landingham. And the question is, what do you think are the most important issues facing us, and how would you address those issues? Mr. There are two key issues facing us. One is our trust deficit. When I go around, people have lost faith in the institutions of Congress. They've lost faith in Wall Street, they've lost faith in the media. And we need to restore people's trust and confidence in government. That is why I've come out with a five-point reform pledge, not taking any special interest money, not taking lobbyist money, not taking corporate money, buying my own health care, not taking the congressional pensions, and living like every other person in this community. We need a Congress that lives like the rest of us to restore people's trust in government again. And the second issue is the income inequality and the lack of opportunity. We have moved to an economy where Apple computers, one employee can produce $2 million of wealth. You can make a lot of money in this country and not expand employment. And we need serious thought about how are we going to solve that? How are we going to prepare people to understand programming, computer coding? How are we going to get more women in science and technology? How are we going to get people to understand 3D printing and robotics and have the jobs of the 21st century? We need a Congress that's capable of grappling with serious economic challenges and issues to make sure everyone has an equal opportunity. Thank you. 
Mr. Hunter. Thank you very much. There's about three basic things I would look at, the economy, jobs, and education. Now, I have a unique background in education. I've been working in the educational field, and that makes me a professional. I have no bones about it. Uh, working with youngsters, preschool, through the K-12, into postgraduate. And I, I think that gives me a unique perspective of what young people need, especially in a diverse community like ours. Our community has forgotten about how to take care of preschool and pre-kindergarten youngsters to prepare them for the future. We talk about STEMs, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. Well, we start at the fifth and sixth grade. We have to go back to the youngsters where we could lose them as they go through our schools. And some of the ways we have to look at how they speak, how, what kind of language they use in, in the playground or at home, and convert that into scientific or classroom instructional language so that by the time they're in the uh, kindergarten and going on through the schools, they'll have the same kind of literacy that everybody else has. Now, jobs and economy. We have to have a robust economy in, in Silicon Valley. I've been able to do that by bringing projects and jobs here. The part to San Jose is at least 10,000 uh, permanent jobs, and we need to have jobs that's good for everyone. Thank you. Mr. Van Lanning. Um, I want to jump on something Mr. Kana said. People have lost faith in government, and I would have to say it's because of what has happened in government over the last decade especially, uh, which both of these gentlemen participated in as a, as a fact. Um, not taking any money for campaigns. From what I understand, Mr. Kana has got a couple million dollars he's taken. Mr. Han has got close to a million. And my pledge has been, if you're going to send me a check, send it to a charity. I don't want your money. I don't want your money. I want you to sit down and evaluate your candidates and see who is going to represent you the best. Whether it's a professional politician, whether it's somebody who's been involved with the Obama administration, or whether it's somebody who is a Silicon Valley person. Who is going to represent you the best? Who can you put your faith in and regain that faith in government? Who has got the best interest for your children? Like I said, I have I have made it a point to say that I don't want anybody to send me a dime. If you have money to spend on politicians, send it to King's Ransom. It's an organization that's building schools in India. For ninety dollars, you can feed an orphan for a Thank year. Thank you, Mr. Van uh, The next question is a sixty-second response, um, and it will go to Mr. Van Lanningham, then Mr. Connor, then Mr. Honda. Question number three, both the House and the Senate have been working on a new immigration bill. What, in your opinion, would result in an equitable and effective immigration law? Increase the H-1B cap. That's what we need to do. We need to increase the H-1B cap, regardless of what anybody says about borders and giving away American jobs. I was slammed the other day at the Republican Committee because they told me I was outsourcing American jobs because I believe we should get the intelligence of this world in this valley. I believe that having more people here that have that drive, that Zuckerberg drive, that, that drive to build businesses, that will build real careers, not BART welders, not people taking tickets. It will build real careers, and these people can build off of that. Thank you. As a son of immigrants, I mean, my father came here in the 1960s as a chem to study chemical engineering. My mom came as a substitute school teacher. Uh, I appreciate the immigrant story. And it's no coincidence that this district has been the heart of economic innovation for the nation, and it's also one of the most diverse of the nation. We need to recognize that immigration helps create jobs. It's a no-brainer that dreamers should have citizenship that we should have a path to citizenship for folks who are here who are undocumented. The statistics are that most of the people who are undocumented aren't coming across the border. They've always already overstayed, and so we need to make sure how we transition them into citizenship. We need to have sibling reunification and have equity for people of same-sex uh, couples for immigration. And those are the broader principles that I will take to Congress. But the case I will make 
is that immigration strengthens the United States and gives us a competitive advantage in a global economy. Thank you. We know that the immigration system is broken, but I believe what we have forged together on a bipartisan basis in the Senate is a bill that the president of this country said he's willing to sign. I met with him yesterday, and we sat down and strategized of what else can we do with our communities and move those folks who are reluctant right now, has stated their support for it, but what we need to move them forward to action and make sure that John uh, uh, Boehner uh, puts the vote out there. It is a balanced package. We have ag, ag workers and chamber of commerce working together. We have high tech with the H-1B and they're working together and it's a package that's come together uh, that's never been done before and now we have to work with the undocumented and the family unification. I'm proud to have added to the family unification the definition of binational same gender uh, couples as part of the family that we need to consider. Thank you. The next question is what we call our lightning round. It's a yes no answer um, and um, the order will be um, Mr. Honda, Mr. Van Landingham, and then Mr. Kana. And the question is, do you support limits on campaign contributions, Mr. Honda? Yes. Mr. Van Landingham? Absolutely. Um, Mr. Kana? Absolutely, yes. The next question is a 60-second um, response, and the order will be um, Mr. Kana, Mr. Honda, and Mr. Van Landingham. The question is, our country has weathered the housing crisis, bailout of banks, and now a slow return of jobs. What are your suggestions for increasing jobs for U.S. workers? Well, I have put forward a concrete plan, economic plan, uh, to address exactly this issue. I have called for uh, tax credits for hiring long-term unemployed and those who are veterans. I said that we need to start teaching coding in the classroom, not because we want a world where everyone becomes a computer scientist, but because the reality is everyone is going to be need to be technologically competent in the 21st century to get a job. Just today I was out knocking on doors in Sunnyville and I met a teacher uh, there who taught band and music. And it's also important that we have the arts because it's going to require us to be creative and innovative in the 21st century. I've called that more women need to be participating in Silicon Valley. I mean, do you know only one in seven engineers in Silicon Valley are women? And I have called for paid parental leave and child care tax credits. Uh, I can't go through my whole plan, but I am very proud of having a detailed seven-point agenda for how we're going to create jobs in the valley in the country. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Silicon Valley really needs a robust economy, and we need to have a, a valley that people who make Silicon Valley work, that they're able, to, they're able to be able to afford to live here. I've been able to bring jobs to um, this valley. $900 million barked in San Jose. That's 10,000 permanent jobs, and we have the next step to go to. I've been able to work with Silicon Valley Trust uh, Fund, where they participate with private industry and local governments to put together a fund to help people to get into Section 8 uh, income, uh, Section 8 uh, rentals, and they're also able to help uh, first home, first time homeowners with their closing costs and low interest mortgages. I'm working on a bill of uh, HR 1213 that's going to provide $200 billion that will help trust fund like Silicon Valley Trust Fund to be able to effect that and work uh, very, very closely with the housing authority to be able to get people not only jobs but also into homes. Thank you, Mr. Van I'm sorry, did you want to rebut? I now. Uh, 45 seconds. One rebuttal. Yes, Mr. Um. I respect uh, the congressman's effort to bring BART funding, but the congressman said he brought jobs back to Silicon Valley. And here's the reality. There are no earmarks anymore in Congress. And the people who create jobs are small business owners, entrepreneurs, people who max out their credit cards and take risks, people who are working hard to pay the mortgage, 
political leaders, what we can do, we can invest in the National Science Foundation, in the National Institute of Health. We can figure out how we support entrepreneurs. We can figure out how we support people to get the right education. But we should always remember that it's the American people, it's people in the district who are creating jobs, and it's not coming because of money from Washington. It's coming because we need the right congressional policies to allow them to flourish and be able to create those jobs. Thank you, Mr. Uh, our second rebuttal, um, Mr. Honda. Well, I appreciate that rebuttal, but the fact remains, I've done something. I put $900 million from the Transportation Department, and we did part from uh, from uh, Milpitas to uh, Berryessa. That created hard jobs for everybody, from blue-collar workers to white-collar workers to engineers and professionals. That is what people want. They want results, and that's what I've done. It's not theory. Thank you. Um, now back to Mr. Ben Lundy, the original question. Would you repeat the question? Sure. <laughs> Our country has whether the housing crisis, bailout of banks, and now slow return of jobs. What are your suggestions for increasing jobs for U.S. workers? Well, first, let me let me uh, put something out there. Hopefully, that will sink in. Is that you cannot buy prosperity? It doesn't matter how much money the government gets because the government's going to tax you for that money. You can't buy prosperity. We need innovation is what we need. We need to promote people who are innovating. We need a system where if you go to college and you spend $200,000 on your degree, that should all be deductible. Every penny of it. We shouldn't penalize people for being educated. And it's about time this government understood that, that by taking more money from the people to create more middle management jobs is not helping. We need to help the people who want to innovate things, who want to create things, who want to build things. Not, oh, the economics of taking $900 million here and putting Thank it you, here. Thank you, Mr. Van Leidingham. The next Thank question you. is a 30-second response. And the order of responders will be Mr. Van Landingham, Mr. Kana, then Mr. Honda. Question number five, 30 seconds. Fracking is a hot topic. Should the federal government establish uniform rules for fracking, or do you think it should be legislated by each state? Mr. Van Landingham. Fracking, wow. Let's destroy our world just to get some more gas. I don't think the government should be involved in that. I think that should be state legislated. I think the government should focus on more renewable energy than drilling into our planet and busting rocks up to get gas out. We have an enormous energy supply in the sky, people. It's huge. It comes out every morning. We have wind that blows. It's free. You know, we, we have to be called to something better than what we are. Thank you, Mr. Connor. This is an issue I feel very passionately about. Uh, global warming is an existential threat to our planet. And I have called for ending the Halliburton loophole, which in the federal government, fracking is not subject to the Clean Air Act and a lot of the other federal regulations. I've called for ending that. And I've called for a federal moratorium on the Channel Islands and on federal water uh, that fed fracking shouldn't be permitted. I'm very proud of this policy. It's on my website, and it's one of the boldest policies to take on uh, fracking as being regulated by federal environmental yeah. regulations. Mr. Honda. Fracking uh, is a process, a chemical process. And when I heard about fracking in Keystone, my immediate reaction is that, number one, no, we shouldn't do it because of the fact that the process is going through the State Department and then through the executive branch. There was no science, no analysis other than that. So uh, just the process was bad, and I just said I can't support that. On the fracking uh, process, it requires a lot of water, so it's not going to help anything. It's Thank you, It's going to be contrary to our health. Thank you. Uh, the next question is a 60-second response. Uh, the order will be Mr. Honda, Mr. Van Landingham, and then Mr. Kana. And the question is, what action would you recommend to address the problem of money and its growing influence in politics? Mr. Honda. I believe in uh, public financing of politics, and um, I think that um, my, my funding is, will show that uh, over half of the people that contributed to my campaign has been about $100 and less. And I think that uh, making money, 
the main optics of a, of a campaign really distorts really what a person needs to do and what a person has done and accomplished. And so I think that the, the idea of having unfettered uh, resources for those who have the money gives people with money more voice and more freedom of speech than those who have less money. So the issue of uh, how much money you have should be controlled by public funding. Mr. Van Landingham. Uh, would you repeat that question one more time? Yes. What action would you recommend to address the problem of money and its growing influence in politics? Give it to the poor. Give the money away to the poor. If I need to raise two or three or four or five million dollars to run negative ad campaigns to get you to vote for me, I'm not the guy who should be representing you. I'm sorry. That's a fact. You know, there, I hate to beat this drum, but there are kids out there starving to death. And you talk about $100 here, $100 there. $100 would feed one of them for a year. One of them for a year. Or I could put all that together and run a negative ad on Rachel Maddow or one of these TV shows that pissed off about this and that. You know, like I said, it is time for us to be better. This same old thing has got to go away. We've got to step up and we've got to change. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Connor. The Citizens United decision and McCutcheon are two of the biggest threats to American democracy. And politicians have been talking for the last 20 years about campaign finance reform. But nothing gets done. And so I have taken a different step. I have said I'm going to lead by example. I don't take a single dollar from corporate PACs. I don't take a single dollar from lobbyists. In fact, my campaign chair was in D.C. and he said, why do you want to get there? You're already going to be hated by all these uh, interest groups there. I take no money from special interests. I have said all the candidates here should not, uh, voluntarily pledge that no super PAC comes into this race and that we do what Elizabeth Warren did. We are only going to change this system if candidates take it on themselves to take pledges not to take this money. That is why Larry Lessig endorsed my campaign. Uh, Lessig, if for those of you who saw on May 1st, has this whole uh, movement to get rid of the special interest money in politics. It's fundamentally what's corrupting democracy, and it's why I'm so proud of our campaign's pledges in not taking it. My turn. Rebuttal, Mr. Van Leningham. Over $2 million. Over $2 million you have taken in campaign money. Over $2 million. You were, you were in the Obama administration. When did you come up and say, let's stop this madness? Let's stop this. We're supposed to be for change. That's never happened. That's never happened. You put some lines up on your website about how so-and-so likes you and how so-and-so likes you. That's not true. Over $2 million has been raised by the Connor campaign. So take that for what it's worth. Thank you. Well, the next question is, um, actually I would have two back-to-back -back, uh, lightning round questions and the order will be um, Mr. Honda, Mr. Conduff, and Mr. Van Landingham. The question is, do you support drilling for oil in the National Arctic Refuge? No. Mr. Conna. No. Mr. Van Landingham. Absolutely not. Uh, same, or I'm sorry, uh, different order of the next one, also lightning round, Mr. Conna. Mr. Honda, Mr. Van Landingham, do you support drilling for oil on or off the California coast? No. No. You cannot drill your way to independence, no. Okay, that's slightly, slightly out of order there. The next question is a 60 second response, and the order will be Mr. Van Landingham, Mr. Connor, then Mr. Honda. And the question is um, the Supreme Court ruling in Shelby County versus Holder has weakened or has struck down significant parts of the National Voting Rights Act. What is your position on the National Voting Rights Act? That's, uh, we'll start with the, Mr. Van Landingham. Oh, so this is a complicated one. You know, I am, uh, this, is a, this is a tough one for me because I believe every vote counts. I believe everybody should have a voice. Everybody should be able to express their voice and it should be counted. And I think we are, we are at, a, at a stage in our evolution to where we can make that happen. So I am, 
Like I said, this is a very complicated one for me to answer, um, simply because I can't talk about the technology that's required to make this happen, but I believe that we are at a stage where we have the technology where we can make every voice come. Thank you. Mr. Connor. The Voting Rights Act is perhaps the greatest piece of legislation of the 20th century, and it is unconscionable that the Supreme Court would strike that down. Anyone who read the recent New York Times article, it was sobering, about President Obama, who inspired so many people, including myself, so many high school students, to get involved. And you look at his share of the vote, the Caucasian vote, in the Deep South, and I recommend that article to anyone, and anyone who thinks that uh, as a country we still don't have issues around race, uh, is just not being honest. We need to uh, strongly reinstate the Voting Rights Act, uh, and I think it was an embarrassment uh, that the Supreme Court struck that bail. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. I was disappointed in the Supreme Court's decision. Um, those who were uh, for that decision said that they wanted to update the current uh, situation in our country so that we can show that the Supreme Court, the, the, um, the Civil Rights Act is old and it needs to be um, needs to be eliminated. So they got rid of preclearance, and that was an important thing for our communities. However, they, they should have gone, we should have gone further in saying that if we need to update it, then let's update it by uh, keeping it intact and also adding the, the, uh, the phrase, we have other emerging communities that's going to be needing that kind of consideration also. So emerging communities are going to be left out while we ignore the, uh, the communities that we were trying to take care of in the first place. So it was a very, very uh, disappointing uh, decision by the Supreme Court. I didn't support it, and I'm working hard to revise that. Thank you. The next question um, is a 30-second response, and the order will be Mr. Honda, Mr. Van Landingham, and then Mr. Connor. And the question is, what do you think should be the congressional role in overseeing the National Security Agency? Mr. Honda. Thank you. Good question. Congress has a, a uh, responsibility to make sure that we know the line between national security and privacy. And that's the thing that I always worked for ever since my earliest memories being in an internment camp, that there was a lot of uh, information that, wasn't, that shouldn't have been allowed to the government, like the census. And so the, government, uh, the Congress really has to play an oversight, a very strict oversight ruling over NSA and any other government that has access to private information. Thank you, Mr. Hunt and Mr. Van Lundy. The NSA should not be reading our mail. They don't go to our office, they don't go to our letterbox and open up our letters. Our new form of communication in this world is email, and the NSA has absolutely no right to read, store, view, leverage your privacy, your information, or your email. I think Congress should take an extreme stance on this and step on their necks until they stop it. Thank you, Mr. Conan. The problem is that Congress hasn't exercised oversight over the NSA. And from this district, we need someone who's going to speak out very, very clearly and say that the right uh, to mass surveillance or to having mass surveillance should not exist, that you need probable cause before you can have your emails read that we should declassify the Justice Department opinions that had uh, the, were the foundation for the NSA, that individuals should have a right to privacy even amongst consumer internet companies. I've come out with an Internet Bill of Rights that addresses that. Uh, the next question is a 60-second response, and the order will be Mr. Khanna, Mr. Honda, and then Mr. Van Landingham. And the question is, what do you think should be the federal government's role in protecting our country from the physical, economic, and public health effects of climate change? Mr. Kana. When you talk, go to high schools, and I've been to almost every high school in this district, this is the issue that inspires young people. They get it. They get that climate change is an existential threat to our planet. And we need people who are going to address it. We need a, to invest in alternative energy, in RBIE, in solar, in wind, in geothermal, in making sure that we have strong alternative energy. We need strong regulations against coal emissions, and I was spoke out very strongly against the Keystone Pipeline, which would not advance the debate. 
we need to make sure we're regulating mercury emissions and selenium emissions. And we need to inspire, just like John F. Kennedy inspired people to go to the moon, we need a generation, a new generation to be inspired to find the solutions of alternative energy. And we're better than here in Silicon Valley, uh, where we can really be a model for solving the energy independence issue and solving climate change. Thank you, Mr. Honda. I said before that teaching youngsters STEM, science, uh, technology, uh, engineering, and math is important at the beginning. And this is to grow a citizenship and a citizenry that have what we call scientific literacy. So they be able to think and be able to consume information in a very logical way. That drives public policy. That drives the uh, policymakers. On top of that, we have to have a federal uh, role in uh, how we work with other countries. President Obama, in his first uh, year, he sent uh, um, Secretary Chu and Secretary Gary Locke to China to establish a relationship with China to develop trust so that they can share in research and not fight over intellectual property, which is a major thing that separates our countries. Developing trust, developing a citizenry that can think clearly and make good, good decisions. Thank you, Mr. Ben Landingham. Tough question. What do we do about saving our planet? We do. We have to educate our youth. They have to take up that cause. They have to step up. When you look at places like Greenland where it's melting, I mean, it's, it's tragic. But you cannot depend on the government to do this. Much like, I think it was Mr. Obama gave Swan for $900 million. And they were out of business a couple years later. I mean, we need to really step up as a people and do better. This is our planet. This is our gift. We cannot have it destroyed. We cannot let it go on. We can't buy our way out of it like these gentlemen would like to do. It just won't work. You have to step up and you have to take that cause. You have to stand up and be counted. And that's a fact. And if you're not willing to do that, this planet's going to slowly die along with your children and their children and so on down the line. Thank you. Uh, the next question is a lightning round question. Uh, you'll have three choices. Uh, please just select one of them. And you will have 15 seconds if you want to do a quick response, 15 seconds to why you are choosing one of those three choices. And the order will be Mr. Ben Landingham, Mr. Kana, and then Mr. Honda. Um, the question is, Military spending in the United States is still the highest in the world, with the U.S. spending more than three times more than its next largest spender, which is China. What would you do? A, increase spending, B, decrease spending, or C, maintain existing spending? Mr. Van Landingham. I would go with option D. Stop sending tanks overseas and start sending tractors. Teach people to farm, teach people to grow food, teach people to feed each other. That would be my option. Mr. Khan. We need to decrease military spending and stop fighting the Cold War and invest instead in education, which is really going to make this country lead the 21st century. Mr. Khan. I'll decrease the spending because uh, we've already made great cuts uh, in the, the Department of Defense. But having said that, we need to also invest in ways that we can develop a national security, international security partnership with other countries so that... Thank you. Uh, the next question is a 60-second um, question. The order will be uh, Mr. Honda, Mr. Van Landingham, and then Mr. Kana. And the question is, women today still earn just 77 cents for every dollar that a man earns. What would you do to end discrimination against women uh, in the workplace? Well, I'm very proud that uh, I was part of the uh, effort to um, make sure that we passed a bill called the uh, Lily Ledbetter uh, uh, bill, which gave Lily Ledbetter her back pay. But that was just a model. We have to make that uh, predominant in the private sector and in the public sector. Even the public sector is inequities uh, in, in the pay. No. No woman should be working till March before she starts earning the dollar in the equivalency of a man. So the inequity in our in our uh, pay schedule 
And the way we look at uh, women's worth uh, has got to change. Equal pay for equal, right, uh, equal work, equal pay for comparable worth. Sven Lundingham. Well, first, I think that, that uh, we all should have equal pay, regardless of whether you're a man, woman, doesn't matter. Everybody should get paid what they deserve. Secondly, I think that we need to really build in some sort of incentive for on-site child care. That seems to be the big one. I mean, women seem to have to not only take care of the household, but also go out and have a professional career. And how do you do that when you're running back and forth? I mean, it's tough. So if we were to increase tax credits for companies that put child care on site, why couldn't we do that? Why couldn't we, you know, give them a, a big tax benefit for letting us have our kids on site preschool? Thank you, Mr. Connor. I was a strong supporter of the Lilly Ledbetter Act and believe we need equal pay for equal work. But this problem is much bigger than that. I mean, do you know we're the only country where maternity leave is still considered a disability? We need paid parental leave in this country. You know, my brother, would, a sister-in-law, would scoff at the idea that she has to do the childbearing and somehow the uh, husband is off the hook. I mean, we're living in a time that's backwards and many other Scandinavian countries are much ahead of us. I agree with Mr. Van Lingdingen. We need childcare tax credits for companies. We need to get more young women interested in math and science between seventh and ninth grade. We know that girls are smarter than boys in math and science in sixth grade, statistically. We know that. But something happens. They lose interest. We need to make sure they still have interest. And one of the things I'm so proud of in this campaign that came from conversations with Mary Shine and Linda Sells and Cheryl Sandberg and Marissa Meyer and a lot of other people is my Women in the Workplace agenda, which I think is one of the most comprehensive agendas to get women an equal role in our workplace. Thank you. Uh, the next question is a 30-second response. Uh, the order will be uh, Mr. Honda, Mr. Connor, and then Mr. Van Landingham. And the question is, many states have passed laws which now limit choice for women, making abortion more difficult for women, and essentially eroding Roe v. Wade. How do you feel about these state actions? Mr. Honda. Well, it's unfortunate that the federal government didn't make a federal a ruling on uh, women's right to choose. Um, in the uh, in the Affordable Care Act, uh, we make sure that that's going to be effected. Um, the the um, the federal government has to take on more responsibility in terms of making sure that the woman's right to choose to, to be able to uh, say that a woman's condition is not a pre-existing condition. We were able to pass a law that put that aside and made that old-fashioned. Thank fashion. you, Mr. Honda. Mr. Khan. A woman's right to choose is a basic constitutional right. I've been serving on the board of Planned Parenthood Marmonte uh, for many years because I believe in this. And I believe that many people in our generation just take it for granted. And they don't know that there's a large assault on these rights. And the biggest thing we can do is make sure that it's protected under the 14th Amendment as a matter of equality, not just privacy. I mean, it's a matter of fundamental equal rights. Uh, to have a woman's right to choose uh, protected, and I will be a very strong uh, champion of this. Win or lose, it's something that I've believed in. Would you repeat that question again? Because I don't think the question was about a woman's right to choose. Many states have passed laws limiting choice, making abortion more difficult for women, and essentially eroding Roe v. Wade. How do you feel about these state actions? I don't think the state should have the choice. I think if the federal government mandates that a woman has a choice, <clears throat> then the federal government should back that up. They should make it a federal law that it's the woman's choice. Personally, I am pro-life, just so you all know. Now, I know I lost a bunch of you right there, but I believe that somebody has to speak for the voice that cannot speak for itself. Thank you. The next is a lightning round question, and the order will be Mr. Kana, Mr. Honda, then Mr. Van Landingham. Question is, would you strengthen or weaken the role of the EPA? Mr. Kana. I would strengthen it. Mr. Honda? I would strengthen it, definitely. Mr. Van Landingham. Would absolutely strengthen it. Uh, the next question is a 30-second response, um, and the order will be Mr. Kana. Mr. Van Landingham and then Mr. Honda. Question is, should gun violence prevention be addressed at a national level, or do you believe that this should be a state issue? Mr. Connor. 
It should absolutely be addressed at a national level, uh, especially after the horrific school shootings we've seen and the horrific violence we've seen. There are some things that are just basic common sense, like a universal background check, like making sure we don't have magazine clips uh, that can go off uh, and kill hundreds of people. I mean, this is not a Republican or Democrat, it shouldn't be an issue. This is just a common sense issue for any industrialized country to be competitive, that we need to have basic universal background checks and get rid of the magazine. Thank clip. you, Mr. Van Lenningham. I would agree, we need a universal background check on, gun, on uh, guns issue. I do believe, though, it is the state's authority to control that, to dictate that, to mandate that. I don't think that's a federal government job. I think if you live in the state of California, you should abide by the rules of the state of California. But I do believe in a universal background check, yes. Mr. Uh, you know, I'm really proud to be on record of uh, being uh, against uh, the assault weapons. Uh, we should ban assault weapons. I am for the universal background check. Uh, we also have an opportunity under the Affordable Care Act to make sure that mental health is part of that. Uh, consideration. There's, uh, we have to close loopholes in the gun shows that we have there. You could drive a truck through those loopholes and also on the federal level the tier out amendment has to be eliminated because criminals can... Uh, the next is a lightning uh, round question um, and the order will be Mr. Honda, Mr. Connor, and then Mr. Van Landingham. And the question is do you support a carbon tax on fossil fuels? Yes. Mr. Connor. Yes. Mr. Van Yes. Thank you. The next question is a 60 second question. Um, and the order will be Mr. Kana, Mr. Honda, then Mr. Van Landingham. The question is in your opinion, what is the best way for us to safeguard our food supply? Well, I think we have to. Uh, make sure that we're doing more uh, farming and agriculture here at home and encouraging uh, organic uh, food and organic growing and making sure that we have labeling of genetically modified food so that we are actually uh, encouraging people to grow food and uh, in, that is nutritious. Uh, the second thing that we have to do and we have to care about not just our food supply but I think uh, the global poverty and global food supply <laughs> America is best when we, when we lead, and there are a lot of people around the world uh, who don't have adequate food. And I think we have to bring uh, the industrialized world and the countries together uh, to think about uh, how we can have uh, sustainable food development, not just for the United States, uh, but for other parts of the world. Thank you, Mr. Honda. Food insecurity is a, is a global issue. Two things. One, we have to be able to provide seeds, and seeds that are not connected to any one monopoly where people can use the seeds and that it will be reproducible and not be hybrids. The second is access to water and being able to cultivate and be able to water the plants and the, so that they can have a harvest. So we have, it's a combination of a couple of things that we need to look at when we talk about food insecurities. There's no reason why we as a rich country should be hoarding um, and putting, into, putting aside all the greens that we have when we can share it and, and distrib uh, distribute that with other countries that certainly need it and at the same time uh, be able to share the, the technologies and share the science of, of, of better production. We have to get away from also corporate farming and allow people to be able to have uh, distributive farming where farming can be done economically and closer to the, where people live. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Van Lendingham. First thing, no GMOs. No genetically modified food. You know, I have a 12-year-old daughter who I fear for because what she eats and how much she's developed at 12 years old. We should not be eating genetically modified food. We shouldn't be passing it off to the rest of the world. This is a, this is a question that's more than just our, our supply. This has to do with global supply. If we teach the world how to farm rather than how to bomb them, if we teach them how to farm and grow food, that is the one thing that this planet should have excess of. This planet should be able to produce more food than we could eat. We should not have one hungry person on this planet for lack of food. And it's absolutely ridiculous to spend the kind of money we do on a military 
rather than going into Afghanistan or somewhere and teaching these people how to grow food. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, um, it'll be a 60 second response, not 30. Um, and the order will be um, Mr. Van Landingham, Mr. Connor, and Mr. Honda. The question is, what are your thoughts on the, Cal uh, the water bill, specifically those addressing uh, issues of it, addressing California, a uh, bill that is uh, in Congress? Mr. Van Landingham. Should we be shipping water to other parts of the state rather than the Central Valley? That's a big question. And yes, LA needs water. And you know, they need water in Southern California. But we should we foregrow our farmers and our agricultural industry to do that? I don't think so. I think that uh, that water should be distributed equally. Water shouldn't shouldn't be rationed. We shouldn't have six houses on the block with glowing green lawns and fifteen with none because only part of the people are doing their part. We need water to grow food. I mean, it's cyclical. It doesn't make sense to ship our water elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Honda. Uh, Connor, sorry. This is an issue that really affects Fremont uh, and the 17th District. We rely on water from the Delta. And Senator Feinstein's bill uh, is a bad bill. It's a sop that it too much to agriculture business, which de removes too, uh, many of the environmental regulations on the Delta. And if I were in Congress, uh, when I am in Congress, I would speak out against that because I think protecting the Delta, the environmental regulations, uh, is critical, and especially given that the 17th District's water supply is so reliant on the Delta. But beyond that, we shouldn't prioritize uh, agriculture at the expense of our environment. I am sympathetic to the agriculture and the uh, interest and the need to develop it, uh, but not at the expense of lowering the environmental regulations. Mr. Honda. I'm, I'm very proud to have worked on the, um, the Bay Delta uh, Water Quality Act and to make sure that the water quality of the Delta is going to be monitored by what we call a biological um, indicator. Um, but going beyond that, on the federal level, there's about three areas that we need to be concerned about. One is continued research in uh, reverse osmosis and also recycling and reuse and storage where that, that money can be used so that the urban areas can have fresh water sources and not be completely dependent upon Northern California water. The second is ag is doing something. Ag has gone to uh, drip um, uh, irrigation. And I know some farmers that have 30 and 300 acres of almonds and they grow grapes. And they do the, the kinds of things that we ask them to do. Flood, uh, flood irrigation is old fashioned, but we have to also take care of, it's a balancing act of ag, urban dwellers, and recreation. Thank you. The, um, the next is a story we'd like you to tell us. And the order will be uh, Mr. Hanna, then Mr. Honda, then Mr. Van Landingham. Um, and, and the story we'd like you to tell which I hope is a true one, and this will be um, a 90-second response. <laughs> Voters want to trust their elected officials and want to ensure that there's a, that they can feel that there's they're, they're someone that they can work with and they know. Can you share a story or an example um, of some, some program or some project that you have worked on and where you have engaged and worked with the community <coughs> and in which you're most proud? Uh, Mr. Khan. When I was uh, at the Department of Commerce, the, it was common knowledge that the issue that really affected so many people in Fremont uh, was the closure of NUMI. And it is hard if, I mean, I'm a resident of Fremont, but if you don't live in Fremont, it's hard to imagine what an impact that had uh, on this city and this region. Fremont fashions itself as a manufacturing town, and to see uh, that close and to see people uh, being laid off uh, was one uh, was devastating uh, for the city. And I didn't do a lot, but I had a very small role, uh, like many people did. I was at the Department of Commerce and I uh, signed up to join the auto task, task force. And I helped bring a grant back 
uh, to the city of Fremont, working with Sergio Santos and a lot of the people at the UAW. And the grant said to, that Fremont should keep that as a manufacturing site, shouldn't just be uh, bringing in developers and building housing there, that we could be a great uh, manufacturing city still. And what that meant uh, to, I think, this city, and what I saw that meant in the hopes that we could have advanced manufacturing, and now we have Tesla, and that we could still be competitive, uh, really made me see that uh, public service, uh, you could make a difference, you could impact the community, uh, and you could help uh, actually give hope to people uh, in the most dire situations. Thank you. Mr. Hunter. Thank you. Uh, the way we engage people and gain their trust and their confidence, on a school board, we had to close 15 schools in one year. I engaged the community and made sure that they're the ones that looked at the criteria and gave us the list of, of, for which to close. My school was not included. I put it in there because it met the criteria. The Board of Supervisors, I created the Open Space Authority. We made sure that we had open space that would complement the Mid-Peninsula Open Space, and now we have uh, uh, inter-district, uh, inter-county uh, uh, open space uh, authorities that will provide open space for, for recreation. Uh, under the, uh, un with the Board of Supervisors, I uh, wrote the uh, General Plan Amendment for Open Space and Trails. That's a 33-month um, effort between property owners and open space folks, two diametrically opposed groups. Where I brought them together in 33 months and came up with an agreement. And on the, uh, in Congress, I was able to work with uh, 26 educators that came up with a re recommendation on equity of education for each and every child. That was a monumental document that we're putting out, and that's the reason why I need to be in Congress to finish this kind of work. Mr. Landingham. Well, I didn't close 15 schools, and I'm not responsible for bringing Tesla here, supposedly. Um, you know, what I've done in the past is very small in comparison. You know, I would have to say, if you if you want a story that describes me, my, it would be my family. You know, I'm a I'm a devout man of faith, and my daughter, who's 12 years old, one day said, "Dad, we need to do something about the homeless problem, because every time you drive up the street, there's somebody holding a sign." So we started making up what we call blessing bags, out of out of uh, Ziploc bags, and we put socks in them, a little can meat, and the Bible. And a number of different things that would hopefully help somebody out. And as we drove down the road, my eight-year-old daughter, my 10-year-old son, and my 12-year-old would say, Dad, stop, 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 reach out the window, see if they need some help. And that's what we did, and that has caught on to our church. So we do that at our church now. And we actually carry, in friends of ours, carry bags around in our cars. So as we're driving and we see somebody in need, hopefully we can give them a hand up. I would say that's what I'm most proud of, is my family. And if you want to know me, that's that's who I am. Okay, I didn't, I didn't do all this other closing schools and got a billion dollars from government to open something and give another billion dollars away. I, I didn't do any of that. Thank you. Uh, the next question is a 60-second um, response, and the order will be Mr. Van Blendingham, Mr. Connor, and then Mr. Honda. And the question is, how can the federal government, what can the federal government do to increase funding and support more affordable housing? Mr. Van Leidingham. Create more opportunity is what it could do. Housing in this area is not going down. We're running out of land. They're building more houses. House is a million dollars now. A million dollars to buy a house. That's absolutely ridiculous. I don't know. I don't, I don't know anybody who... 10 years ago or 20 years ago would have said it's a million dollars for a house to live in this valley. But when you have people, like we said, at Apple that are making $600,000, we have people that are at Google that just you know make $150,000 on salary but get evergreened shares, push them up to $500,000 a year. I mean, these are the people that can afford it. What we need to do is create more innovation. We need to create more people that could do these jobs, more people that could leverage these things, more people, you know, especially our young people, our children, and we need to really enable them to be successful. We need to groom them for success. Thank you. 
Mr. O'Connell, sorry. When I'm out in the community uh, knocking on doors, this is one of the biggest issues that comes up. And I feel it personally. I'm still paying off my student loans. Uh, most kids are graduating from high school or college, can't dream of buying houses uh, in this area. And the reality is we run the risk of having communities where teachers, firefighters, police, nurses can't live in the very communities that they serve. This isn't just wrong for them, this is wrong for everyone. I mean, what a boring world to live in a community and send your kids where everyone's a computer scientist or works at Apple. I mean, it's not a great education. We want to have diverse communities. And I think a congressman can uh, play a role in making sure that the zoning laws uh, in, in speaking out, so cities zone for some form of affordable housing. So we have grants, particularly for teachers in areas that we need for, that, so that they can uh, have, take advantage of housing, and for those who are city responders. Uh, but we definitely need to make sure that our communities are diverse. Thank you. Mr. Honda. I've worked with a, a variety of uh, levels of government, and I found that zoning laws are pretty restrictive, and it doesn't allow for uh, it, it, pre, pre, um, it predetermines what the price of a home can be. So looking at mixed housing, mixed zonings, where you can have a variety of folks with different uh, income levels live in a neighborhood, and I guess it's about recreating and redefining what a neighborhood looks like. Because when you have a neighborhood that's mixed, your schools will be mixed and balanced. And so to be able to have affordable housing, I've worked with groups like Silicon Valley Trust where they are providing funding uh, for those who need uh, affordable rentals and well, first-time home buyers, but also we're creating um, funding through we're looking at the kinds of uh, income tax returns that we can look at and say that certain ways we can find two hundred billion dollars to re reinvest back into our neighborhoods so that people can afford rentals and be first-time home you. buyers. Uh, the next question will be um, a 60-second response. Um, the order will be Mr. Honda, Mr. Van Landingham, and then Mr. Kahnem. And the question is, please describe what you feel should be the federal role in education. Mr. Honda. The Constitution says that that which is not explicit is the purview of the states, and public education was not mentioned in the Constitution. If it were, it would be a, a federal there will be a, a definite federal role, and the federal government needs to take a, a greater uh, role in the fiscal part where we should be able to fund every child and so that every child has the resources to be able to uh, realize their potential. We do that with the military. We do that with the post office. We do that in other ways for the U.S. Uh, Patent Office. We should be able to do that for our youngsters in public education. There are natural resources. There are future. And they're one in public education is the pillar of our democracy. So we should be able to take a, a federal action and make sure that states cooperate with each other, but we tell them we're going to help them with the financing because all the states run into trouble when they have to balance their budget. And when they balance their budget, they cut education. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Van Leningham. Why are we out of prosperity? Do you really want an education system like the post office? Honestly, no. What we need to do is we need to assign X amount of dollars per student. And then we need to let those schools compete for students for those dollars. The minute we start saying, hey, Bob Smith here, Jane Smith here, they're worth $7,500 to a school, a school's going to turn into a business and they're going to say, well, our school's going to offer academics and we're going to offer music and we're going to offer art to try and compete for those dollars so they can do more for those children. We need to reach out to things like code.org to expand our children's horizons. We need to, gosh, I hate to say this, we really need to revamp our educational system here. The last thing we need is the federal government coming in and stomping all over it and turning it into a post office. Thank you, Mr. Conn. Let me ask this. What is going to make America a great country in the 21st century? Having one more B-2 bomber or having an educated workforce and an educated uh, group of citizens? We, we do some things very well in the federal government. We can make a B-2 bomber. I mean, we, we have the greatest military. So it's just 
not the case that we couldn't do education well if we cared. You know, of every dollar in education spending, only 10 cents currently comes from the federal government. And yet, whether we have an educated workforce is going to determine the future of our nation. We ought to have the federal government say that we need coding in the classroom, in the curriculum. This is not original. Estonia does it. Other European countries do it. We ought to have the federal government look to Finland on how they teach, uh, prepare teachers. Here's what I know. Whether the federal government gets its act together on a real education policy is going to determine whether America leads the 21st century. Thank you. The next question is a lightning round question, and the order will be uh, Mr. Honda, Mr. Kana, then Mr. Van Eindenberg. And the question is, um, would you be so, would you, would you increase or decrease the current H-1 visa program? I should, it should remain the same as it is reflected in the CIR, the Comprehensive Immigration Reform, 160,000. I support the Comprehensive Immigration Reform, H1P visa. I believe we need to increase our B caps. We need to import as many talented people from around this world into this valley. Uh, the, um, I'm conscious of the time and our commitment to um, com complete this, and I believe I'm getting close. But there will not be time for me out any other questions. So I would not like to ask um, each of the candidates for their closing comments. Um, we will go, let's see, in the order will be Mr. Kana, Mr. Honda, and Mr. Ben Landingham. And this is a minute and 30 seconds. Well, I would like to thank the League for hosting this and for such a great turnout. I'd like to thank my opponents. Uh, Mr. Van Langdingham, you're much more charming in person than in the papers. <laughs> and uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Congressman Honda uh, and your many years of service to our community uh, and our country. Uh, you're a good man, and I think you would agree that Congress right now is broken. And it's broken at a time where we have huge economic challenges. I know one person and one member of Congress can't change things overnight. I'm not naive. But one person can set an example. And that's why I've taken this pledge not to take special interest money or PAC money or lobbyist money, not because I think I'm holier than thou, just because I want to try to change something, start something different. It's why I said that members of Congress shouldn't take gold-plated pensions and health care that isn't available to other Americans, so we can restore a sense of trust. And it's why I've said that we have to have a real economic policy and vision, teaching coding in the classroom, teaching about arts and music, opening doors for women in science and technology, and creating middle-class jobs. The bottom line is this, there are a lot of good people in Washington, but the system is broken, and we need new ideas and new energy to move this nation forward. That's what I'm offering in this campaign, and why I humbly ask for your vote to be your congressman, to help bring change to Washington and restore our democracy to its founding ideals. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Thank you, and uh, ditto with um, Mr. Khanna. The, um, you know, from my earliest memories, from internment to my two years in Peace Corps in El Salvador, there's one thing I've been convinced of. I have not lost faith in our government, and I will, I'm continuously trying to provide the voice for those who don't have a voice. And one person can make a difference if they try. One person can make a difference if they have the faith that a, a government like ours can make changes that would be phenomenal. And that's why I have this you know, abiding faith that our country, although imperfect, as the Constitution says, in order to form a uh, more perfect union, we knew that, they knew that, and because of imperfection, well, there's a lot of work to be done. I don't lose faith in it. I try to behave and bring home results so that people continuously have a greater expectation of our government. Now, Congress is not perfect. It has glitches. But this year we passed on a bipartisan basis a omnibus bill, a spending bill, that would get us past sequestration. It's a, and we also passed a variety of things like 
on a bipartisan basis. We got this comprehensive immigration reform out of the Senate on a bipartisan basis. We are now waiting for the House to do this on a bipartisan basis. We got 197 Democrats, three Republicans on record. We got 30 people that says they want to do this. Thank you, Mr. Honda. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank these gentlemen as well. I think you're both good men. I mean, uh, I know I might have been a little hard. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I agree with Mr. Connor. Congress is broken. It's broken. Our political system is broken. Our government is broken, and it needs mending. We can't just throw it all out. We have to fix it. And over the last decade, no offense, Mr. Hanna, but it's there has been no fixing. Mr. Khanna worked for Mr. Obama, President Obama, and there's been no fixing there. It's time for you to have your voice heard. It's time for us to to change things. I mean, we talk about teaching coding in the classroom. You know, what happens when we set up a teaching coding class in the classroom and they start teaching Fortran or Pascal? It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. We need to reach out to organizations like Code.Organization and build a uniform program with them for our kids to teach the methodology of C++, of COCO development, of grab and drop type development, things that are actually going to be used, things that MIT's got a great app teacher to teach kids how to build apps. I mean, if we want to teach them the methodologies in that, that's what we need to do. You know, another thing that was said here that you might not realize is, is I actually grew up in East San Jose. My mother was born and raised in Mexico. I'm a Mexican-American. I know a lot of you don't know that. Um, and I have worked with some of the greatest, sorry. Thank you. Let's all now give our candidates a round of applause.